Hi, everyone. Welcome to the September 25th edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined very shortly by my co-host, Craig Milkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to be handicapping some racing this weekend at Santa Anita, Belmont, and Remington Park. The focus, though, is on some major Breeders' Cup preps, and most of those are taking place out in California. We've got a trio of grade one races, a couple races for the two-year-olds. We'll talk about one of those, the American Pharaoh, a couple turf races, uh, the Rodeo Drive for the Phillies, the John Henry Turf for the males. And then the major event, uh, the real headliner on that Santa Anita card on Saturday is the Awesome Again, which features the matchup between the two stablemates in Bob Baffert Barn, Maximum Security and Improbable, likely to be vying for favoritism probably in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, we'll see how they match up against each other in this prep race on Saturday. At Belmont, they're running the Vosburg, and we'll wrap up with that uh, Remington Park race at the end. But Craig, let's start in California. Uh, we've got some smaller field sizes kind of at all of the tracks we're going to be talking about particularly though at Santa Anita there's quality in these races but uh, they're not the deepest events yeah I mean usually we like to talk mostly about races from a betting perspective in here I'm not sure some of these are the greatest betting races but as we move into the Breeders Cup I, I think people want to hear about the best horses we don't want to just pretend they're not racing or anything like that and as we've talked about before you never know where opportunity is going to rise in some of these uh, as you follow the betting leading up to the race so uh, just keep in keep in sharp eye out as you watch these races and maybe one of those opportunities will pop up Let's start with the seventh race on Saturday at Santa Anita. That's the grade one Rodeo Drive for the Phillies and Mares going a mile and a quarter, a prep for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Now, normally I'd say this race would not have a major impact on the Breeders' Cup. I still think there is an outstanding question about whether or not European runners are going to come over for the Breeders' Cup this year, given the whole COVID-19 situation around the globe. Uh, that's kind of an unknown factor. So we'll see if these horses can actually compete on Breeders' Cup Day. Uh, this is not the strongest group group of fillies and mares uh, in the turf division out in California that we've seen even in recent years. Uh, just a lot of allowance horses that seem to have uh, achieved graded stake success, and they'll be competing against each other here. The class horse in the race is obviously the number six Lady Prance lot. She's the only prior grade one winner in the field, having achieved that in the American Oaks last year. Uh, she's yet to win so far in 2020. She hasn't always had the best pace setups. That could be an issue again here, though, because I don't see a whole lot of speed in this race. No, as you say, on paper, this could be one one of, if not the weakest grade ones I've ever seen on paper. It's it's not a strong field, but it doesn't mean it's a terrible betting race. And, you know, I think it comes down to the two Baltus entrants in here, uh, Bodicita and uh, Lady Prance a lot, as you mentioned. Those two faced off in the yellow ribbon uh, a couple starts back for Lady Prance a lot and last time out for Bo Bodicita. And... Um, Lady Prancelot wasn't able to get to her that day, but I think the distance uh, change is probably going to favor her in here. It seems more up her alley than, than the other one. Uh, Bodicita has been a horse who, even when she was in Europe, was kept mostly at short distances uh, to a mile. She's only ventured out to that even a mile and an eighth once. So I think she has more question marks than Lady Prancelot. Uh, it does look like the one horse, uh, Tona Hoodoo will have a pretty easy lead in here. Um, but I, I just don't know if she's she's good enough to be to feel like this. But then again, it's just one where you have to keep an eye out on the prices because I, I do think these horses are, are fairly evenly matched, even including the top two. Uh, as you said, out in Southern California, there's not a huge jump from an allowance race into even a grade one as we see here. But normally if we, we're talking about grade three or grade two, we see allowance horses often jump up. So it's just one where I'm going to play the board. Uh, I do think Lady Prance a lot. If I had to make a top pick, she would be the one. But, you know, there would be some others I'd be interested in betting, including that one horse, as I mentioned, Tona Hoodoo, if she is going to be clear as the pace projector shows. Yeah, I agree that Lady Prance lot is the horse to beat. I didn't feel that she got the best trip to back in the yellow ribbon when she was just sort of always 
in behind horses, never really getting into the clear, even in the stretch. I just didn't love the ride she got that day. And also the pace really favored the horses up close to the front, uh, including Tona Hutu and Bodhisita, who Bodhisita got an absolutely perfect trip in that yellow ribbon. And then last time in the John C. Maybe, again, that was a paceless situation. A horse wired the field. And I actually thought Lady Prenslaw put in a really strong late run to almost nail that uh, winner on the wire. Uh, she's coming into this race in good form, despite not having won recently, as you said, the mile and a quarter might help her more than some others. So I do think she's the horse to beat. I wanted to get a little more creative. Uh, I'm going to take a shot with the number two Maxim rate. Uh, she looks a little bit slower on paper, maybe than the top contenders, but she beat Tona Hutu fair and square in an allowance race two back. That was only going a mile, but she showed that she could get longer distances last time in that stakes at Delmar going 11 furlongs. Uh, she got there at the late stages that day and was just able to hold on some over some horses that were coming at her late. Uh, I think the turn back to a mile and a quarter is probably going to help her a little bit because she seems stretched to the limit going a mile and three eighths last time. And she just seems like a four-year-old filly that's rounding into form and... I don't think that much of the favorites in this race, so I'm not going to be surprised if a late developing and proving horse is able to take a step forward and beat them. Yeah, I, I have no problem with that. I did want to mention one thing about some of these horses that are coming out of races at Del Mar. Uh, people who use Timeform US and DRF Formulator, if you're looking at the pace figures, will notice we don't have any. And that's just a situation where the, the GPS wasn't reliable. Del Mar made an announcement they were going to just hand time all the turf races, uh, which aren't reliable. We, hand timing just isn't reliable. So I would recommend looking at the charts to kind of get a feel for how the pace was flowing in these races and who came from where uh, if you're looking for a uh they try to figure out the pace, as you were mentioning, like in the Lady Prance a lot race. Uh, on turf, that's almost as good as the figures themselves a lot of times. So just a note for our users of why there are no pace figures in there. Yeah, a lot of times in those situations, you just have to watch the races to see how they were run to get a sense of how the pace really shaped up in terms of race shape. Uh, one other point I wanted to make about Maxim Rate is in both of these turf stakes we're going to talk about at Santa Anita, there's no pace. I think it's even more of a problem than the John Henry, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But uh, one thing that we saw consistently in New York over the past couple months is that Luis Saez, in situations like this, just takes the bull by the horns and sends his horse to the lead, whether they're projected to be there or not. And I don't know if it's going to be the same in California where nobody else wants to go to the front, but Maxim Ray does have a little bit of tactical speed, so I would imagine uh, her rider is going to use it. Let's move on to the American Pharaoh. Uh, this is a grade one event for the two-year-olds, obviously a prep for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. They're also running, running the grade two Chandelier on Saturday. There's a big favorite from the Bob Baffert Barton there. We're not going to talk about that one, but this American Pharaoh drew a pretty competitive field because you've got a likely favorite in Spielberg, who's still a maiden. Uh, he's obviously run well in both starts and picked up a grade one placing behind Dr. Scheibel in the Amer uh, Del Mar Futurity last time. But he's got to stretch out, as most of these do. And it's not like he's got some massive speed figure edge over this field. No, he, he certainly doesn't. Now, notably absent in this field is Dr. Scheibel, uh, who Brad Free reported is being laid off for the rest of the year. Apparently doesn't have an injury, just the strategy they're using. So good luck with that. So I get a bit frustrated with that kind of stuff as a horse player. But hopefully they're looking out for what's best as a horse, as I would imagine that they are, and uh, wish him luck. But yeah, Spielberg, you don't often see a maiden come in as a favorite in a grade one, uh, obviously off his second in that Del Mar Futurity. Um, for me personally, it's kind of hard to see any other horses that have run on dirt beating him here. Uh, some of them were in that same field he was in last time. For example, Weston, they were both up right on the pace, and he put him away pretty easily. None of the others, others have figures that can match what he's done. But there are three horses in here who haven't been on dirt before. So I'm kind of looking for your opinion on those three. Uh, I am a little curious about Notable Exception. I was really surprised to see him be seven to two on the morning line off a, an easy win on the synthetic at Arlington Park, but in really slow time. And nobody's really want, run back out of that race. I think one horse did on turf and actually regressed off his low figure. So I'm not sure what to make of that one, if there's any stories with him or workout reports that's something i'll see more as we get into the weekend but curious your take on this race yeah there's just a lot of guesswork to be done because really most of these horses haven't gone two turns before at least on the dirt and uh 
a lot of them just haven't run speed figures that suggest they're good enough to win a grade one. So you have to kind of sift through and, and determine who you think is going to improve the most. And I mean, notable exception is obviously a candidate to improve. He's only raced one time and he won pretty easily at Arlington. Looking through that field, it doesn't seem like he was beating anything of real quality, uh, but he certainly did it impressively. As you said, the time was relatively slow. Uh, I thought he got a good education watching the race, kind of sitting inside of a horse that was kind of running off on the front end and just taking over and winning easily. He... I don't think switching to dirt's going to be a problem because he looks like a big, strong son of street sense, and there's plenty of dirt pedigree on the damn side. He's a half-brother to Tatters to Riches, who won the shared belief uh, going a mile on the dirt in California a couple years ago. Uh, so I think he's going to handle the distance. I think the surface is fine. It's just a matter of how good he is. And if he's among the shorter prices, I thought you could probably find some better value in this race. The horse that interested me the most is the number two, Rombauer. Uh, he looks a little slow, uh, and he's only run on the turf, so obviously he's got to prove that he can run faster on the dirt. Uh, but he's a son of versatile sire, twirling candy, who can get dirt runners just as easily as he gets turf runners. And on the dam side, all of this dam's foals have been very versatile. They've been successful on the turf, and they've been successful on the dirt, and a couple of them have been arguably more successful on the dirt. And watching this horse's races... Uh, he seems like one that's not going to mind ex added ground. He finishes off his turf races very strongly. And I watched uh, his last couple of drills on the dirt, especially last time out at Santa Anita on September 20th. Seems like he really handles the dirt pretty easily. And uh, I think he's a horse that's going to come running late in this race. And if some others have trouble with the distance, uh, I think he could have a shot to run them down at, down at a price. And I should also mention Ron Bauer. That's a really good California wine if you're into that sort of thing. It's one of my favorites. But uh, another horse I did want to mention is on the outside, uh, Wasperin for John Sherris. If there's another horse who I think could improve quite a bit off his of speed figures, it would be him. He's out of Union Rags. He's He's been in a couple races. Uh, one Last time out, he did go the mile in two turns. The first time out was just six furlongs. But his two lifetime races have a lot of those blue fractions showing he hasn't had much pain to run into and I think if he gets any kind of pace in here which is pretty likely with Spielberg and Weston uh, we could see a big improvement on that 82 speed figure he ran last time yeah we're, we're pretty much on the same page here and looking to new faces because Spielberg's okay Weston won that best pal I just get the sense that some of the two-year-olds we saw in those graded stakes during the summer at Del Mar aren't the best that we're going to see in this crop, uh, even out West. So I'm just looking for new faces, as are you. Moving on uh, to the next race on that Saturday card at Santa Anita. It's the John Henry Turf Championship going a mile and a quarter on the turf. And uh, kind of previewed this before when we were talking about the Rodeo Drive. Another situation where there is just no speed on paper. Maybe that's going to work in the favor of number three, United, who's going to be the favorite once again. He's had a pretty strong season. He's won a trio of grade two races, uh, lost a close decision last time in that Del Mar handicap, but he's coming in as the clear horse to beat, and he's got tactical speed. So that makes him dangerous. He's just, he's just never a horse that really excites me at a short price. No, I would agree with that. I was going to call him our old friend because it seems like he runs a lot. I was shocked to see it's like this is only his fifth race this year. But I think it's been a while since he's had a break going back to last year. Uh, and he's just always in these grade ones in Southern California. But he's a horse I, I pretty much try to beat because he doesn't always have any particular speed figure edge over the group. Uh, he does win more than his fair share, but it's always at a short price. So this is one where I'll be keeping an eye on the tote board of course. Uh, Salvatore Mundi is a horse who on the pace projector does appear to have a pretty big edge. Now, whether uh, he would take advantage of that or not is a, di a different story, but with uh, Rispoli on, he's clearly, I think, the best turf rider in Southern California, and I think he's going to give him a, a good trip and take advantage of that early speed. So he's one I'd consider using. Uh, a couple others I'd keep an eye on, uh, on here is uh, the Richard Baltus horses. Oscar Dominguez more so than next year's. Uh, I'm not sure about next year's at a mile 
mile and a quarter. He, he's always been kind of a miler type. Uh, it almost feels like desperation with him. Uh, he seems to have lost any form of early speed that he's had before. So of the two, I much prefer uh, Oscar Dominguez. Uh, even Originaire really ran well last time. Uh, he was flying late to, to almost get to United as a runner up behind Red King in that Del Mar handicap. So there are a lot of different ways you can go in here. And this is just one I'll be t keeping an eye on the tote board and seeing if any of them kind of slip through the cracks. Yeah, it was a race that was difficult for me because United is way the horse to beat and he's likely to get another good trip. He often gets very good trips because of his versatile running style and his tactical speed. Uh, I just don't want to bet him as the odds on favorite because he, he typically, as you said, he doesn't have much margin forever and uh, he does he do, just not a horse that wins by large margins. So he's always vulnerable to getting beaten. Uh, I think Originaire is the most likely upsetter. I just worry about the pace situation for him the most because he's got no early speed and he just loves to sprint to the finish in his races and it's going to be tough to pass them all in this race. Uh, I'll use him, but uh, I, I couldn't make him my pick over United because they faced each other now the last three times in a row and United's beaten him all those times. Uh, the interesting horse to me is the one that you briefly mentioned, the number five, Salvatore Mundi, not just because of the pace projector. I mean, he he could be on the lead in this race. He does seem to have more tactical speed than most. Uh, but watching his last race at Del Mar, I mean, I don't know what he was beating. It was just a nominator of one. And some horses have come back to improve their speed figures and run well, but still it wasn't this class. But boy, did this horse look good. I mean, he just destroyed that field. As soon as uh, Umberto Rispoli asked him to go, I mean, he opened up nearly five lengths in mid-stretch, and I, it says he only won by two and a half. To my eye, it looked like more than that. I mean, he just won that race so impressively, and looking through his PPs, he's a horse that was meant to be good at one point. I mean, he was actually uh, a close third, nearly winning the grade three bourbon as a two-year-old. Seemed like some things went, off, went wrong for him after that. He wound up in claiming races, but since the claim and since he's returned from a layoff for Phil D'Amato recently, he's just been an excellent form, and one performance is better than the, than the next. Uh, so so uh, I think that he's going to run really well here. Uh, beating United is going to be a tall order, but uh, he's the most interesting alternative to me. Yeah, it's why you were talking. I went and looked. Three horses have run back, and they've all improved their speed figure between four to six points. And if Sal Salvatore Mundi does that, he easily could be in the mix in here. So, uh, And as you say, he's not a horse who has to have the lead. The pace projector almost just kind of picked him on top. He just by default because nobody else is a front runner at all and he kind of has that edge so yeah i agree about originaire i think he'll probably be too short anyway so yeah if i had to make a top pick uh, i guess it would be salvatore mundi as a better i do think united's the most likely winner but i'm always going to take a shot against horses like him the main event on Saturday at Santa Anita is the Grade 1 Awesome Again, going a mile and an eighth. This prep for the Breeders' Cup Classic drew five entrants, but it's a small field, pretty strong field, because you've got two major players from the Bob Baffert barn, the number two improbable, and the likely favorite, the number five maximum security. They are two of the top handicap horses in the country, uh, both coming off Grade 1 victories, and Probable's actually won two Grade 1 races this year, uh, the Gold Cup and then the Whitney at Saratoga. Uh, Maxim Security is probably going to be the favorite uh, after winning that Pacific Classic so impressively. This is the toughest test that he'll have faced, though, since entering the Bob Baffert barn. And I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he's going to beat Improbable. No, I don't think it is. I, I do tend to favor him a little bit in here. First, just let me say up front, uh, the chances that I make a bet in this race are slim and none because I, I can't see any of the other three actually winning the race. But what I found interesting is in a five-horse field, basically all of these horses have some pretty good early speed, if if not just being outright front runners. Uh, we have a horse like Take the 101, who, who's been winning a lot of races in lower classes in Southern California for a while. Uh, he always shows speed. He draws inside, so it's hard to imagine that Jose Valdivia is not going to go with him. Uh, we've seen Sleepy Eyes Todd, who was kind of a surprise entering he's been running in nebraska texas charlestown uh you name it he goes there he flashes his speed so it's hard to imagine uh he's he has any other way to go his best races all come on the lead uh, i should mention he was the runner up in the oklahoma derby with last year race we're going to talk about later so i do worry a little about 
about improbable drawing inside between speed horses with his gate antics in the past. So that's why in this short five horse field, I just think maximum security drew the perfect post position and he's going to get a good trip and, and where improbable is going to need some things to go his way. So that's why I would prefer him of the two. Yeah, I think both of these horses from the Bob Baffert barn are pretty versatile. Um, they both can come from slightly off the pace. Uh, maybe maximum security drawing outside, as you said, gives him a slight advantage. But I, I didn't anticipate that either of these would be badly compromised by their trips. Uh, I do think that the horses that you mentioned are going to go out to the front, uh, Sleepy Eyes Todd, and take the 101. And I guess these two horses, these two favorites, will stalk them. Uh I hope that they both get good trips because I think it's going to be a nice showdown between these two. As you said, I'm not really looking to bet this race. Maybe in a multi-race sequence, I would just kind of use both of them to, to close things out or, or get to the last race. Uh, but uh, I'm just looking forward to watching this race. I, I think that they both have run well this year. You could argue that Improbables had perfect trips in his recent races, particularly the last time out in the Whitney when his main rival Tom's Day Ta blew the break. But he's been in great form, and, and I think he's going to give Maximum Security a run for his money. Yeah, the interesting horse for me in here is the one I didn't mention is Midcourt. I actually thought he ran really well in the uh, San Diego when Victor Espinosa just kind of took it to maximum security early, gunned out, went fast. And I'd really like to see him run that way. But given all the speed in here, I I'm not sure they're going to change uh, in the Pacific Classic. He kind of raided off the pace, didn't do much running. So he's one I'm not sure to what to do with. Uh, I mean, I don't like him in the race. I, I think it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't scenarios here where if he goes, he's probably in trouble. And if he doesn't, he's probably not going to out finish the two favorites. So tough spot. But I will be curious to see what the connections do with him and, and see if they revert to those tactics of the San Diego or try coming from off the pace again, which hasn't really been his thing at all. Let's head east to Belmont Park, where on Saturday they're running a couple of graded stakes races. Not as stacked as Santa Anita's card, where they're running Breeders' Cup preps. Uh, there might be one Breeders' Cup prep at Belmont. We'll see if uh, that Vosburg actually produces any Breeders' Cup sprint starters. Uh, but let's start things out with the eighth race on Saturday at Belmont. It's the Grade 3 Noble Damsel. And having looked at the entire card on Saturday, this is one of the most competitive races of the day. Uh, you've got, uh, I think, nine, ten horses entered, nine entered for turf. And you could really make a, a solid case for about six of them. Chad Brown has three in this race. Uh, you've got a strong entrance from the Christoph Clement barn. Uh, it's hard to know where to start because you've got horses coming out of different races at Saratoga. Many of them have similar speed figures. I guess we can look at the pace projector because we're likely to see Blowout go to the front. She seems like the horse in this race that you can kind of differentiate because she has that front running style. And that always makes her dangerous in turf races like this. Yeah, I was going to start in the same place just because she's the one I think we know what she's going to do because she always does it. She goes to the front, sets the pace, and tries to hang on just as she did in her return race. She was off, I think it was about 10 months. Uh, came back, wasn't able to hold off sweet by and by last time, who's actually the second choice behind her in here. Uh, you don't often see that in New York where you have an allowance race producing the couple morning line favorites for graded stakes. But I think it's warranted in here. Both of those two have proven to be stakes performers in the past. Uh, but that said, I, I don't particularly love either one of them. They can certainly win, but I'll probably look in a different direction. The horse I'm leaning to the most is the third choice in the field, uh, Feel Glorious. I really liked her late race last time uh, where she was able to overcome a slow pace, get up to beat Shalor, who's also in this race, who was up front and kind of got a head start on her. So she, she's one I like. Uh, I'm not uh, in love with the cutback and distance for her. I think she might need every bit of this mile. So for that reason, as a better, I'm going to win every bit of that four to one before I better. But she does have a speed figure edge on the other. So she would be my top pick in here. Like I said, no real knocks on blowout. Uh, she had every right to get a little, a little tired last time coming out of that, uh, coming off that longish layoff last time and get run down by sweet by and by. And if she controls things on the front end, uh, she's certainly going to be tough to deal with as well. 
Yeah, when I was making the morning line for this race especially, it was kind of hard to, to sort these horses out and determine who the public was going to gravitate towards. I mean, you've got three key races, that optional claiming race in Saratoga that you mentioned, which blow out and sweep by and by exit. Uh, you've got the perfect sting, which Feel Glorious comes out of, and you've got that De La Rose, uh, where the two Chad Brown horses finished in a photo finish. Uh, I kind of thought that the De La Rose was the weakest of those races, so I downgraded Nor Sahara and uh, Viadera just a little bit. Uh, I really thought Nora Sahara had no excuse to lose that race. She got a perfect trip, and Viadera, who had to go a little wide to make her rally, just just nailed her on the line. Um, Viadera has the... Po- I mean, there's the, the chance that she could step forward again. It's just her third start in this country, third start off a long layoff. Uh, so she might be improving. I just thought that she hadn't quite shown the same level of talent that some of the others had. Uh, I do tend to favor the couple of horses coming out of that optional claiming race. Uh, as you said, a blowout was first off the layoff last time, so she does have a right to take a step forward now in this second start as she moves back into graded stakes company. She showed real uh, class as a three-year-old running competitively in a number of graded stakes races, and that pace advantage is just going to make her dangerous here, especially going the one-turn mile. So um, I-, I think that she's uh, a serious contender, but... I don't see a reason why Sweet By and By can't nail her again because Sweet By and By uh, chased her last time, got the better of her. Uh, Sweet By and By did have the benefit of having a race under her belt when she got in that prep and the caress two back. But, I mean, it's not like that last performance came out of nowhere. She's always been a really good horse. Even when she was in Steve Glaceris' barn last year, uh, she's competitive in these graded stakes. She's got speed figures that put her in the mix, and she's got the tactical speed to sit close to blowout again. So I picked Sweet By and By. Uh, we'll see if she's uh, vying for favoritism or if she gets kind of lost on the board because she's going out for a lower profile barn than some of the others. Uh, but uh, she was the one that I wanted the most. I've got no problem with Feel Glorious. Uh, what you said is correct. She ran really well last time, closing into that pace. I thought Junior Alvarado gave her a great ride, kind of overcoming a little bit of adversity and making the the last move with her because that's what she wants to do when she's ridden correctly. She's always dangerous in these races, so I'll use her as well. Uh, they were really the three for me that that uh, I preferred. A sweep by and by, blow out and feel glorious, mostly in that order. Yeah, just one last comment. I mean, I mentioned the layoff or blowout. I'm one who doesn't think layoffs are that big a deal on turf. Uh, the horses don't run all out for the whole race. It's kind of almost like a sprint race to the wire. So, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if blowout doesn't take a step forward, and particularly for a guy like Chad Brown, who generally comes off the, brings his horses out of the barn firing off a layoff. So I would never make a bet based on expected improvement for that kind of runner. I just wanted to it didn't want to confuse people thinking that it was what I was saying. Moving on to the next race at Belmont, uh, the ninth. It's the Grade Two Vosburg Invitational. Uh, this race was, uh, I think, downgraded this year from a Grade One last year, but still could serve as a prep for the Breeders' Cup Sprint uh, because. I mean, just before we get into this race, that sprint division is kind of wide open at this point, especially after the retirement of Volatile, who was supposed to be the heavy favorite in this race. I don't know where Vacoma is. Uh, He's, I think, only worked twice since the Met Mile. They were initially talking about this race, but obviously he's not ready yet to run. So uh, with those two horses currently on the sidelines... I don't really know who's the leader of this sprint division, so maybe if somebody puts forth a big performance in this Vosburg, they could vault themselves up into the, uh, you know, into the conversation. This Vosburg, though, it's it's a, a field of horses that really need to get back on track because you've got a lot of horses that have shown potential at different points in the past, uh, but none of them are really necessarily in great form right now. Um, aside from maybe the horses coming out of the forego, uh, but they have some things to prove at this distance. So it's kind of just a really difficult race to handicap. It is. It's funny you mentioned the the Breeders' Cup Sprint. I was actually talking about it. I'd almost love to see Serengeti Empress run in that race. I don't want to get too far off track here, but I mean, who are the males to beat with Volatile out, as you said? Uh, it seems like the six furlongs would be right up her alley, and it, it may actually be an easier race than how the Philly and Mare Sprint shaping up, but we can save that one for another day. Uh, I, I found this an interesting betting race for sure. Um, I mean, the two to one morning line favorite is Engage, who we haven't seen since last year's Breeders' Cup. Uh, he's in for Steve Asmussen. Feels like he's about probably Steve Asmussen's sixth or seventh string. But he's not a horse I want at a short price coming off that really long layoff, a horse who doesn't have a whole lot of early speed. 
So the horse I'm going to go with kind of comes from the pace projector. Uh, True Timber Scent uh, is shown up front on the pace projector. He gets Kendra Carmouche in the saddle, who is an aggressive rider. I mean, it's hard to imagine that he's not going to go. And just none of the other horses in here really thrill me very much. And I, I think he's a horse who can take these wire to wire. Yeah, he's definitely a horse that I considered. I ultimately went in a different direction than True Timber. I, I just... I don't think the six furlongs is going to be a big problem for him, uh, even though he's gone longer in recent races, because he's been effective sprinting in the past, especially when he was in Kieran McLaughlin's barn early on in his career. Um, he arguably ran the best race in the forego last time, or the best of those coming out of it, uh, because he was in the teeth of that fast pace with complexity and held on pretty gamely until the late stages, and win, 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 obviously flew past the entire field late coming from last place. Uh, so I thought he ran really well, and uh, as you said, the pace projector shows him on the lead. I think he's going to be close to it, if not outright on the lead, because he does have that ample tactical speed. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see how they ride this race and whether he can reproduce that form on a fast track. But I do think he's dangerous. I mean, the horses that I don't really want include Funny Guy, who I know we had a slight bit of trouble on the far turn in the forego. Ultimately, though, he got there in the stretch and just couldn't quite get past those horses. I'm not really convinced that turning all the way back to six furlongs is what Funny Guy wants to do. He was so impressive going a mile off the layoff early in the year, and I'm a little surprised that they're kind of turning him into a sprinter now. Um, he's the same connections as Vacoma, so uh, maybe they're, they're thinking that he can fill in for that horse in this race. Uh, but if he's a short price, and I, I imagine he's going to be, if he's bet down to favoritism in the forego for some reason, um, he's just a horse that I wanted to, to go a little bit against here. I mean, Forenze Fire, he's kind of, I mean, in some ways the most reliable option uh, because he's got that strong form at Belmont Park. You know he handles six furlongs. I just, I'm not sure he's quite the same horse anymore. I know he won that true North three back, but he was only beating Stan the Man, and you can look at Stan the Man's PPs. He's a nice horse, but I don't think he's really a top contender in this race. And two back in the Vanderbilt, he did not get a great trip. He was very wide on the turn in a race that featured no pace. But the more that I look back at that Vanderbilt, that was not a good race. Um, and, I mean, Volatile's retired now, so it's a moot point. But I kind of would have been looking to bet against Volatile in the future coming off that performance. Because the other three horses from that Vanderbilt have just been dreadful since then. Uh, Mind Control and Whitmore didn't run in, in the Vanderbilt next time. I mean, in the uh, Forgo next time. Mind Control lost at a short price in Monmouth after that. Uh, so I, I just I just have doubts that Forenze Fire is still the same horse. So I'm just kind of like crossing them off one by one. I don't want to land on a short price, but Engage to me just looks better than these horses. And he's got the layoff to contend with. And I know Steve Asperson doesn't have the greatest numbers off layoffs, but this is also not really a typical move for him to run a horse in a graded stakes off a layoff. And the fact that he's letting this horse pretty much fill in for Volatile and shipping him from Kentucky to New York for this race. I imagine in an, in, a, in an attempt to get him uh, qualified for the Breeders' Cup Sprint, and he explicitly stated in his pre-race quotes he wants to see this horse in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, um, I think it's a good sign. And this horse ran really well in the Breeders' Cup last year. I mean, he just ba barely lost third to Whitmore. Uh, he had to run through the kickback, got kind of bumped in upper stretch, and finished really gamely. And looking too back at his Phoenix... That was a better field than this one. Uh, Whitmore was in there. I mean, he promised us the field was in that race. A uh, bunch of horses, uh, despite that grade two rating, that was really like a grade one event. And he won that race well, even though the time didn't come back super fast. I was never a fan of this horse for Chad Brown, but it feels like he really improved last year for Steve Asperson. And he's just the new face that I want in a race where I'm kind of tired of all the other options. Yeah, I have no problem with that. You almost sounded like Richard Dreyfus in uh, Let It Ride, where he was going around the grandstand marking off all the horses that people <laughs> like. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I it's the same thing for me. It was kind of almost by attrition how I landed on True Timber. But other than the price, I have no problem with Engage at all. Uh, he certainly could win here. His Breeders' Cup was good last year. I'm just looking for a little more of a price. But, uh, 
no problem with those, and I'm with you on the others. Just not a big fan of them. I, I, I think I picked Funny Guy last time out. I, I can't remember, to be honest. But uh, I was just very disappointed in his run last time. Uh, he did have a bit of an iffy trip, but not enough to uh, warrant his finish, I don't think. So, again, just like you, I, I'm looking for some different guys in here. All right, let's close things out with one race from Sunday. It's the uh, Oklahoma Derby grade three event for the three-year-olds at Remington Park. I know this is a race that you always like to to check out live in person every year. Uh, and while it rarely attracts the top three-year-olds in the country, you typically get an interesting field of those B and C string three-year-olds coming for this race. And that's definitely the case this year, as you've got some horses that finished behind Art Collector in that Ellis Park Derby as the main players in here. But there are some other horses coming in from different directions that make this a pretty interesting race. Yeah, last year was a bit of an anomaly. We had uh, Owen Dale win, who was one of the top three-year-olds, I would say. Maybe not the very top, but he, he was a good one. But this year's more kind of the grade three type that we're used to seeing, a, a good strong field of nine. I'll say the pace projector has a fast pace expected. Uh, for me, that's a kind of a tough call. I don't think the speed is all that clear cut. So I'm going to play it like it's just going to be a, a fair, straightforward race with a solid pace. Uh, that said, there's only three horses in the field that have even been able to hit the 110 speed figure mark on time form US. I'll be pretty surprised if one of those doesn't win. So I'll, I'll start by talking about those three and then one other. Uh, of those three, I prefer Dean Martini. Uh, he's a horse that has good tactical speed. He draws an outside post, but that's not that big of a deal going the mile and an eighth at Remington. You have plenty of time to see what's going on. Uh, get, a, get a good position going into the turn. Uh, he was wide the entire first turn last time out against our collector, uh, chasing a horse who is superior while while wide is never a great idea. I mean, not that it was a bad ride. He, he just took what he kind of had to had to take that day. But I think it excuses his finish where he was beaten by 12 lengths. His speed figure actually only regressed two points off his Ohio Derby win. So he would definitely be my top pick in here. Uh, the other one, that one of the others that, that's top that 110 mark is Rowdy Yates. Uh, he draws inside the others, has good tactical speed, and he's actually come back a better horse. He's an Oklahoma bred who had won some, some of the state bred races last year. They tried him in the springboard mile. It didn't work out very well. Uh, they took him overseas for a race. I think it was Saudi Arabia, if memory serves. And uh, that didn't go particularly well, but he's come back. Uh, he had a layoff, and He's run much better speed figures since since that day. He ran a 110 in that same race with Art Collector in that Ellis Park Derby last time. So I, it wouldn't shock me if he wins. Steve Asmussen wins boatloads of races at, at Remington. He's won the Oklahoma Derby before. So he's certainly one I'd give a chance. Uh, Shared sense is probably the one to beat, but he's the one of those three that I'm against the most. Uh, he has very little early speed, and he's just not the kind I like to take as a favorite or, or a horse that's going to be close to favoritism. He can certainly win here, but of the three, he's the one I would be against. Uh, if I was going to try to stretch it a little bit and look for another horse at, at a price that, that's not among that group that's hit the 110, it would be the eight horse Momosa for Mike Maker. Uh, he actually ran at, at Oaklawn this year. He tried the Tampa Derby where he was buried. He tried the Arkansas Derby, the division with Charlatan. Uh, he didn't run very well that day. But he came back with a pretty nice allowance win at Ellis Park. Uh, he got a good figure, a 107, uh, 113 on the final time. But the, the reason I'm not really thrilled with him and looking to bet him is because he just had a cupcake trip that day. All our fractions are in blue. The pace figures are really low. That's why the speed figures knock down a bit. So if I'm playing pick fours or pick fives, I, I haven't looked ahead enough to see what's uh, offered on the card. He's one maybe I'd include as a C-type as a horse, but not one that I love. You could make a case for a lot of horses in this race, and I mean, you you did single out the uh, the favorite. I mean, the um, the logical horses in here, those coming out of the Ellis Park Derby, and I I pretty much agree with your sentiments with regard to those horses. Uh, shared sense, just he's always compromised by that running style he has with no early speed. I mean, it worked out okay in the Indiana Derby two back when things kind of fell apart a little bit for him, uh, but generally he's not the kind of horse that I want to take at a short price. 
Uh, Dean Martini, I, I do th- agree with you that uh, he ran a little better than it looks in the Ellis Park Derby last time, getting involved in that pace. Uh, I still don't know how good he, I think he really is. That Ohio Derby, it was it was okay. That wasn't the strongest field in the world. And Rowdy Yates, I mean, I, again, he's not another horse that maybe had been somewhat compromised by pace, but I've never been his biggest fan. Uh, I just thought this was a race that... While you can make a case for those horses, it features some pretty interesting new faces. And uh, you mentioned one of them in Momosa. I don't have a major problem with him. He might be improving right now. But there are a couple other horses that are somewhat interesting. I mean, the number seven avant-garde is coming in from Gulfstream. He looks pretty cheap. <laughs> I mean, he's coming out of some some cheaper maiden claiming races and, and claiming events uh, before winning that starter allowance race last time. But he's been improving his speed figures at every race. Uh, that figure here in last time looks totally legit uh, and if he takes another step forward he could be right there it certainly seems like he's one that wants to run all day so getting out to the mile and an eighth is going to help him I don't love him in this race but if he gets kind of lost on the board I could consider him and the horse that really interests me is the number one Sallow. Uh, I kind of doubt we're going to get 15 to 1 on this horse uh, because he looks more appealing than that he's never lost in his lifetime uh, but this horse while he's only raced on turf so far He's got a dirt pedigree. Uh, The Dam was a very good dirt horse. Uh, She was a grade three winner sprinting on the dirt. Uh, He's by Distorted Humor, who really is more of a dirt sire. And they've raised this horse on the turf twice. And it's kind of interesting to look back at how this horse started out. Uh, He he was a Zayat Stables horse. Uh, He was originally in Todd Pletcher's barn. I don't know what transpired that ultimately had him debut for Wesley Ward for Zayat Stables two back. Uh, But he was impressive, winning first out at Gulfstream. Uh, Then, obviously, I think a lot of the Zayad horses have been dispersed. Uh, He was sold for $175,000 at the Horses of Racing Age sale back in in July. Uh, He wound up in a new barn, raised a Lone Star last time on the turf. Again, I mean, beat a decent field of older horses somewhat impressively. Uh, And now they're running in the, the Oklahoma Derby on the dirt for the first time. This is interesting to me because this horse has trained well on the dirt in the past when in prior barns. And uh, I just think he's a horse that I don't know what kind of price he's going to be, but he's one that still has real upside in this race. So I'm going to tentatively make him my top pick, just hoping to get a bit of a price. Yeah, that's good info. I kind of overlooked him. I I honestly have no idea who that trainer is. I plan on uh, digging into Formulator to to see what I can learn about Terry Brennan because I don't know much of anything, if at all. I don't even know if it's a male or female, to be honest. Terry could could go either way, so I really don't know. Uh, But yeah, he definitely has a dirt pedigree, and I'm never going to knock a 15 to 1 shot uh, on the morning line. And I, I would be surprised if you don't get that, given the connections, to be honest. Yeah, I just thought it was a really intriguing race where you can make a case for a lot of horses at a variety of prices because I'm just not thrilled with those horses coming out of the Ellis Park Derby. Well, that's all the racing there is to cover this week. Uh, a lot of action to look forward to. Uh, and I think we're going to have a good time recapping it uh, when we do the pace cast on Tuesday because those races in California are likely to sort some things out in different divisions, especially that awesome again where we have that matchup between those two Bob Baffert runners. So looking forward to all of that. Hopefully they gave out some good ideas for you and your own handicapping and wagering uh, of this weekend. So. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can always listen to us on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcast. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. We'll be back on Tuesday with the Time Form US Pacecast, so look for our next episode then. Thanks for listening.